Welcome to the 24th podcast in the Jesus Said That series. Today's episode is the fourth part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and it has some really critical things for our identity Mm. in Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus is going to help define those who belong to a spiritual kingdom, as he has throughout the sermon, and he's going to give six more supernatural characteristics. And these are always tell the truth. Your word can be trusted without giving an oath. Mm-hmm. We're going to see there's a lot of misinformation on this part of the passage. That's right. When someone insults you, you don't seek revenge. Three, go above and beyond when you have sinned against someone in the case that they sue you. Four, go the extra mile. Do more than what is required of you by the law. Five, be generous and help those with genuine needs. And six, display love and pray for your enemies. Mm. So this is quite an interesting podcast. Should be challenging for all of us. Absolutely. This is Podcast 24 in the Jesus Said That series, looking at every word Jesus spoke in the New Testament. Today's episode is titled The Sermon on the Mount, Telling the Truth, Going the Second Mile, and Loving Your Enemies, and is taken from Matthew 5, 33 through 48. I'm Pastor Kenny Burge Jr., Associate Pastor at Coleman Manor Bible Church, and I am joined by my father, Dr. Ken Burge Sr., Graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, author of the Fire series, and senior pastor at Coleman Manor Bible Church, and now I guess grandfather of seven. <laughs> yeah, I was actually uh, speaking uh, somewhere last Friday night, and they had our old bio, mm. and the I was introduced as having now two grandchildren, <laughs> and I said, "Well, I've gotten a promotion since then, so we have seven. So, congratulations to you, Kenny. Uh, it's exciting having uh, uh, Clark with us. Yeah, I was." Joking with my wife, Becca, that I might start speaking in tongues today. <laughs> we, don't, we believe they've ceased, but uh, I might speak the modern babbling at times from lack of sleep. And all the kids have been uh, under the weather as well. So when you have uh, three children who are sick, four, three, and one, and then you have a newborn, you don't get a lot of sleep. But uh, all in all, things are well. So... Um, anything you want to share with us before we get right into the passage? No, just another great text covering a lot of ground. As you pointed out so aptly, a lot of misinformation, particularly with the oath part here. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I look forward to walking through it with you. Yeah, I never really understood the oath as much Mm -hmm. um, until I studied it. But uh, the part that always confused me was if someone tries to sue you. Because it seems like, why wasn't everyone just sue you and take all your stuff? Exactly. Yeah, We're going to see now context is key. Mm-hmm. Jesus is defining kingdom principles. Um, he's going to start with the next uh, phase of his sermon. You have mm-hmm. heard that it was said to our ancestors. That was the phase. And then he goes through all the different things. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you, um, we broke it up because it was just way too long oh, for yeah. one. Um, he will teach the people about their inner motives and being pure in heart, yeah. not simply obeying rules. I think religion is all about rules. That's right. Um, where ours, uh, the Christian faith, is about why you do what you do. Mm -hmm. So let's jump right into this, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. Mm. So I want to make it clear that all oaths are not bad. Um, God made an oath or made multiple oaths. Christians took oaths, such as Paul. So um, oaths in above themselves are not bad. But in this particular cultural context, uh, oaths were frequently used with the intention of deceiving others. Uh, To create an illusion of truth, individuals would swear by heaven or swear by Jerusalem, the hairs on their head, so forth. And this practice was an attempt to trick people while not breaking God's law. And I I think if you look really close, you have to remember these guys are lawyers. (laughs) And look at verse 33, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. So they tried to slide under the radar and kind of say, well, if it's not directly to the Lord, if I swear to heaven or swear to Jerusalem, then I can get out of that oath. You think there's some wordsmithing going <laughs> yeah. on here? Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, and I love the passage, the writer picks up that uh, God gives a promise to Abraham. And by, since he could not swear by anyone greater, he swore by himself. <laughs> yeah. And the point of the passage in Hebrews 6 is that God can't violate an oath, which obviously means oaths have been taken and he's taken them. And uh, also he cannot break a promise. So unlike the scribes and Pharisees, you know, God's word is enough. 
So it's really just the point is being you speak the truth. Yes. Um, because he's going to say, but I tell you, don't take an oath at all. Um, when someone makes a oath to the Lord or says, I swear to God, there was nothing they could do to break that oath. Even in their legal system, they were not allowed. Therefore, they would swear by other things to get out of their oath. So once again, I think Jesus is hitting the heart of the issue. Mm -hmm. It's not oath taking and above itself, mm. but it's the heart issue of deceit, tricking people, saying, I promise, but then trying to get out of that promise exactly. on legal grounds. Jesus's argument is why should you not need to take an oath? Right. Um, because your words are true and you are not deceitful, you should not need to. You should always tell the truth. Mm. When you say yes, you mean it. When you say no, you mean it. There's no deceit. There's no need for an oath because you're a person of integrity. So I kind of picture it as when they're swearing someone in and it's some criminal off the street as a witness. Um, they make them swear because they don't trust the person. That's right. And that's kind of what the Pharisees and those would do back then. So, and your self righteous practices yeah. come out so clear. I, uh, the third command, you know, you don't use the Lord's name in vain. I uh, so, oh, we're not going to invoke the Lord's name. We're going to swear by this or mm -hmm. swear by that. Uh, just such hypocrisy uh, to get around uh, the uh, telling the truth mm -hmm. way. Because uh, after all, the law was given for the moral purpose, but they just looked at the ceremonial yep. as we addressed in po uh, other podcasts. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, because it is God's throne, or by earth, because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. Mm. So Warren Rearsby wrote, the more words a man uses to convince us, the more suspicious we should be. <laughs> uh, and I think Jesus is saying, never trust anyone who has to invoke something holy to be trusted. Because yeah. uh, those who belong to the kingdom, our word should be enough. Exactly. So I think that's a challenge for us as Christians today, too, yeah. as those who also belong to the kingdom that are, we always say yes or no, mm -hmm. and we mean what we say. What would you say as someone with a conscience issue, just pastorally, if they said, should I swear under oath because yeah. Jesus said, you know, this? What, what would you yeah. say to someone like that? Yeah, and you're confronted with this because, you know, you go to court, I swear to tell the truth, the oh. whole truth, but nothing but the truth, that... God took oaths, even Jesus did in uh, Matthew 24, he's uh, being interrogated by the high priest and the high priest adjures him. In other words, take an oath, Jesus, and he does uh, more or less. So if God took oaths and Jesus took oaths and people in the Bible, godly people took oaths, it was basically just a sacred promise. So with that in mind, when you're in a court system and you have to do something legal, of course, it's all right mm -hmm. to, you know, to take an oath, but we should not have to say to people all the time, practically speaking, <laughs> I swear to me, oh. you know, someone's truly word should be their bond. And isn't, doesn't all come to motive? It really does. When they're put telling you at court, tell the truth and all the truth. You should. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your motive shouldn't be going in there. Oh, now I can't tell the truth. Yeah. Or, I can't lie because I swore to it. It's it should, an integrity it's issue. It's an integrity issue. I it, think Jesus is addressing. Exactly. Yeah. So, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. And why is this from the evil one? Uh, Satan is a deceiver and cannot be trusted, mm -hmm. and neither can a person who must swear by holy objects because they are hoping to break their own promises. Exactly. A believer's new identity in Christ is to be a man or woman whose words are not challenged and have no need to swear mm -hmm. because people know they are not deceitful. So, um, for this episode, your kingdom identity, number one, and mm -hmm. because this has gone across multiple episodes, I didn't want to continue with like identity 15 and so forth. <laughs> so identity one, you always tell the truth. Your words can be trusted without giving an oath. So the challenge for the believers, can they always, do they always tell the truth? Um, the passage that had come to mind when we were reviewing this was Psalm 15, because it's speaking about a man of integrity. Uh, Psalm 15 and verse 4 says, he swears uh, by his own uh, hurt and does not change. In other words, even when he's given an oath and it's just true and he gets attacked for telling that truth, he doesn't change. Mm. And that's what God is looking for, individuals who are just truth tellers. 
So number one, always tell the truth. That's part of your yep. identity. That's right. Sum it up simply with no deceit in your heart. Yeah. Then we come to verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Mm. Once again, I think the law is a great thing. Yeah. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was carried out through the Jewish justice system, yeah. not out of personal revenge. So it's not like I punch you in the face and you lose your tooth, so you come and punch me in the face. Exactly. It was more you would go before a judge and they would say, you've done this, so we're going to inflict this on you. Um, so the Jewish authorities would make the person pay by inflicting them with the same injury. And this discouraged people from committing crimes. Uh, if I, I think that's the problem with America right now. You know, you can get away with a lot of crimes. There's no restitution. No, no restitution. That's a fatal flaw. No. Yeah. And I mean, we would consider barbaric to be beaten. But can you imagine if you went to the old practice of, you know, you steal something, you lose a finger, you lose yeah. a hand, all of a sudden you might say, ah. I'm not going to go into Target or Walmart and steal because I'm going to lose a body part. It was meant to be a deterrent. Yeah. Uh, the pro-life passage that really had always stood out to me is the background to the quote mm. uh, from Exodus 21, that if two men are fighting and one injures a woman who is pregnant, whatever happens to that child in the womb, and the implication is it's a, it's a life within mm. the womb, the same would happen to the individual who inflicted the injury. Uh, so it was to discourage, of course, any kind of ill treatment of one another. But if you violate the law, uh, it's going to be commensurate. You're oh. going to receive the same that you gave. And that's a great deterrent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so because Leviticus 24.20 says, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, what e whatever enter injury he inflicted on the person the same is to be inflicted on him so that that's justice it's justice <laughs> make it justice. twice right oh. and then he comes in verse 39 jesus but i tell you don't resist an evil doer on the contrary if anyone slaps you on your right cheek turn the other to him also mm -hmm. this passage has been abused horribly yes so I want to make it clear, a slap is not a hard punch or a beatdown. That's right. It's an insulting, low-grade smack across the face. It brings more shame than pain or injury. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do damage to someone's body, you're going to punch them as hard as you can, trying to break something, kill them, so forth. Mm -hmm. If you're going to damage someone's pride, you slap them. I mean, mm -hmm. why do you do it? You open your fist, it gives less damage. So Jesus is saying, if someone slaps you on the face, don't rage and go back and attack them in anger. Let them slap the other cheek as well. Why? Because you are not avenging yourself, but giving it over to God. Once again, this is not natural. It's a sign that you belong to the kingdom of God. So I think you could do this both physically and uh, as a word picture. You could have it as, you know, someone literally hate you mm -hmm. for your face, so they slap you. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to kill you. They're just yeah. insulting you in public. And you, you can just take it. You don't have to go back. And I think also verbally, if they slap you in the sense that they say something yeah, <laughs> that is point. very hurtful, uh, you just don't go back at them. And uh, keep in mind Romans 12, 19, friends do not avenge yourself. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. And I, I just want to make it very, very clear. Jesus is addressing personal retaliation, not criminal offenses or warfare. So uh, there are some people we know, the Amish, yeah, and others who say, well, we can't strike anyone back. Um, and Jesus is not addressing that. He's addressing those in the kingdom when they come and they insult you or give you this insulting slap across the yeah. face basically saying you're not superior, um, that you shouldn't go back at them. It's not, you know, someone comes up and starts punching your wife yeah. or uh, another country is trying to take you over. So. What this is not pertaining to, as you point out so clearly, example, in Acts 16, Paul and Silas, mm -hmm. and uh, Paul's a Roman citizen, and he's beaten with rods, and they throw him uh, into prison. They put him in the stocks. And when it's time for him to be released because they get word that he's a Roman citizen, uh, he says, no, 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 to, to the jailer, you, you, you just can't let me out. Let go, the magistrates do it. 
It, it was an appeal to Roman law, oh. and law is so different than an insult. And oh. so you make the case very well here that this is uh, an insult. Yeah. So it's not when someone's beating you down. It's that's right. The insult or the yeah. slap. That's. But that can often lead to more. So you exactly. shouldn't. Yeah. So your kingdom identity number two is when someone insults you. You don't seek revenge. Okay. We go to verse 40. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And this is a very difficult part to understand mm -hmm. because uh, people could just take advantage of you. So uh, the CSB Study Bible gave, I think, some really good notes. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to read this real quick. Frivolous lawsuits were rare in the first century Israel. And so the suit described here was probably a legitimate one that the plaintiff was likely to win. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're getting sued yeah. for a very good reason. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Ordinarily, defendants are upset if the judgment goes against them. But Jesus commanded his disciples to seek reconciliation with their opponents mm. by going above and beyond the legal requirements in order, order to make amends. So your identity as a believer is to go above and beyond what the law demands. Uh, I, I think that's so good because we look back with um, when Jesus was speaking very early on in the sermon, and it's if you, know, you have done something to your brother, yeah. uh, go and seek them out before exactly. you go to the judge. Yes. So he understands that even those in his kingdom will make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You might deserve to be sued or so mm -hmm. forth. Yeah. And he's saying here, you know, if someone wants to sue you to take away your shirt, don't get all gruff and say, I'm going to, but just if you're, if you're wrong, say, you know, I'm sorry, here, have my coat as well, exactly. which was a very important, uh, I was reading about this, won't go into too much detail, but the coat was so important because mm -hmm. um, legally they could not take your coat from you because mm -hmm. it was used as your blanket at yeah. night. Yeah. So he's saying, go above and beyond. Mm -hmm. So a kingdom identity number three is go above and beyond when you have sinned against someone in the case they sue you. So if you do something wrong, uh, make it up to people. Exactly. <laughs> and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go two with him. Now, most of you know this, so I won't drag down the point, but under Roman law, a Roman could force you to go one mile with him and carry his gear. It was just, they were always on the move. Yep. If they saw you, they could say, hey, come carry my stuff. Give me a break. Um, Jesus says, don't do that grudgingly. In fact, go an extra mile with him. Once again, this is not natural. It's a sign that you belong to the kingdom of God. I think it's interesting before Paul dies, at least when he's in prison, it said basically most of the guard had turned to Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just kind of an interesting thing, because I think these Romans, they're probably looking at these Christians who obey this and most Romans, that, that would kind of be like, um, pick your country, takes over America, yeah. and then they say, you have to carry my gear. Most Americans would say, that's not patriotic, I'm not going to do that. Where Jesus is saying, show kindness to your enemy. Yeah. And uh, I bet that had a huge impact on the Romans, because they're like, why are these people actually helping us? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? I love the term here, forces. Uh, King James, New King James talks about compels. It was originally a Persian word. It was used of couriers. It made its way into the Greek and into the uh, Jewish and Roman context, but you could conscript someone. So in other words, if you're on an official mission from, say, the king, uh, you could uh, take someone's horse or you could take whatever you needed to make sure that you got the journey complete. Uh, a quick example of this is Simon of Cyrene. Yep. You know, he's conscripted to what? Help uh, carry the cross of Jesus. So it's just an interesting word in, in how it's used. So when we act and go the extra mile, it makes that great impact that oh. people don't understand. Because yeah, it's supernatural. Exactly. Understand. So your kingdom identity for go the extra mile, do more than what is required of you. And this is even speaking in the context of with enemies. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say this applies to a lot, you know. Think bigger <laughs> in the sense of when you're at work, try to go the extra mile if mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. um, for people just to see your identity. And remember, Jesus' whole point when we go back to the first part of the sermon is you're doing all these things to be salt and light, to be that city on the hill, to let your light shine. So the reason you're doing this is that so people will glorify God. Exactly. So 
that's why you're doing these kind of public things. He's mm -hmm. going to go on the private things later, but these mm -hmm. public acts. That's right. Give to the one who asks you, Jesus says, and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to make it clear, this is not talking about someone who wants to borrow your video game system, <laughs> your car. <laughs> yeah. You know, we all have people like that. There's many verses on sloths and lazy people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you don't work, you don't eat, would um, later be told. But this is speaking about the one who has genuine needs. Mm -hmm. The person who comes to you and asks you, um, can I please have this? Can I just borrow this? Because I need, be it food, clothing, whatever. And we're not supposed to turn those people away. Exactly. If you belong to the kingdom of God, you should not be greedy, but generous. Mm. Um, example, the good Samaritan doesn't know the guy who's beat up, right. but he provided for him because he had a genuine need. He was mm -hmm. laying on the road in need of help. And that's how you love your neighbor. So when someone genuinely comes up to you, don't turn them away, mm -hmm. um, but help them. Uh, I know at our church, when people have needs, we evaluate the situation. Mm -hmm. And for those who have not been responsible, we might do counseling with them, help yeah. them meet their need and counsel. Because first of all, we don't have the money just to throw away, but this isn't saying, you know, haphazardly just right. give everything. This this is in to use with wisdom. Mm -hmm. So someone comes to you, show them love mm -hmm. um, and give to them. So... Um, Jesus is using very wise, uh, giving very wise advice here. And he says, I, I, well, I, I want to say, uh, the first five principles Jesus gives us here in this passage, mm -hmm. always tell the truth. You don't have to give an oath. Okay. When someone insults you, don't seek revenge. Go above and beyond when you have sinned against somebody, in the case they sue you, hurt you, whatever, mm -hmm. or you've done something to them, you've mm -hmm. offended them. Go the extra mile, do more than what is required of you. And number five now, be generous and help those who have genuine needs. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is now going to build upon that concept. Yeah. When you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, which the law never states hate your enemy. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Jesus is referring to what we assume the Pharisees and the priests were teaching. Exactly. Uh, the, we assume the Jewish people let their patriotism take over their sense of loving their neighbors mm. and taught that Jewish people must hate their enemies. Mm -hmm. Now, once again, this isn't talking about, you know, your country being attacked, right. being, yeah. you know, stuff like that, the law system. This is really talking about um, just someone that you know at work or your acquaintance with in your town or wherever who hates you. Yeah. Um, who does not like you for whatever reason. And Jesus says, you need to love them, uh, which we're going to see. Uh, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus gives two examples of supernatural love. Mm. One, love your enemies. Mm -hmm. Pray for those who hurt you. And a good question to ask is, why should we love our enemies and pray for them? And then Jesus is going to give the answer. So that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. Mm. So God gives mercy to evil people. He just doesn't strike them dead. His enemies who hate him, he sends them rain, sunlight, mm -hmm. food, clothing, all that. In the same way, we should show grace and mercy to our enemies by praying and loving them. Um, anything you want to comment on before we continue? Because that was a lot right there. No, yeah, well said. Uh, in Exodus 23, if you have an enemy and you see his ox having gone astray, you return it. So the law didn't teach you hate your enemy. You would love uh, your enemy. But I find it interesting because with Calvinism today, there's such an emphasis on God's choosing. And we would both say, you know, if God is love, yeah. and the scripture then clearly shows Jesus died from everyone, that God's love covers everyone. This is an example of that. If we were to follow the model of Calvinism, we would have a selective love. And Jesus doesn't give us that option here. You know, we're to love uh, everyone yeah. in the same way that God shows uh, his love to all people. Yeah. <laughs> And you just think about how dumb the system is sometimes. Yes, and no I offense agree. to my Calvinist friends, but exactly. it's, it's really is stupid. Yeah. Um, 
God determines all things. And you find like verses in Jeremiah that says, I did not plan or determine that. Exactly. You know, and then they have to try to wordsmith it. Uh, God loves all people um, and he cares for all. He provides because yeah. uh, he's a good God. And to think that God, you know, before time again said, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. Um, so that he can show his justice. <laughs> yeah. It's like, so uh, yeah, sometimes you have to step back yeah. from philosophy and just look at scripture. And then you're like, that's a really dumb argument. But uh, actually, just real quick, this morning I was listening to uh, a podcast and it was an excerpt from a pastor who's been uh, kind of all over the charts, but he said free will is demonic. That when somebody <laughs> teaches free will, it's demonic. Yeah. And I'm going, okay, we're off the charts now. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, but no, and I, and I find people don't practice it because why should a Calvinist debate you? If God has determined you to have this view, exactly. Who cares? I mean, at the end of the day, they they hate the analogy of robots. Or uh, with my youth, I would use a video game programmer, and they right. hate they fight this. They say it's mystery. They always have to appeal to mystery when they don't yeah. make sense, you know. But imagine a a programmer creates a video game, and the one character is the bad guy in the video game. And then he gets judged. <laughs> yeah. And then at the end of the game, he says, well, I'm not judging you because I made you that way. I'm judging you because of your crimes you've committed. And it's <laughs> like, you programmed him to do that. So I, it's so, so stupid that, you know, sometimes I think it's sad, but you just have to sit back and laugh because like people can hold to that garbage if they want philosophy. Yeah. But it's, uh, you know. Just quick quote for the first 400 years of the church. Mm -hmm. Up until AD 412, it was taught by every uh, patristic church father that man was given free will. Even with the fall, we're still made in the image of God. So it's uh, Calvin picked up on Augustine when Augustine changed his tune, and that's why we have the system we have. But the Word of God is what we should focus upon and is clear teaching. Yeah, and I, I think you have to, with most bad doctrines and I'm throwing Calvinism in there. It's a bad doctrine. Yeah. Um, you have to, you have to read what I would call the later church fathers look yeah. to the Puritans. Yeah. Um, we won't look at all their crimes, but mm -hmm. look at those types of guys, Calvin, and then say, okay, this is what they taught. So now with their teaching, let's throw that on the scripture. And then you start taking passages, Roman nine, which is clearly just saying God can harden God. It's soft and nothing about damnation. Yeah, because I mean, if he says Jacob I love, but Esau I hated, does that mean that Esau and all his descendants are going to hell? No. Uh, so uh, yeah. he's just saying how throughout time yeah. he had his purpose come to pass. Sure. And uh, I'm I'm just amazed, but you know, people believe it if they want to. I don't, I just don't want to stand before God one day and say, yeah, you know, I taught all those people that you hated them and yeah. you did not offer them salvation because it was your determined will that they go to hell. You know. And then you know, it's just bad. I, you know, yeah. I've, I've seen people do suicide who are Calvinist because they've seen if God made me this way and maybe I'm predestined yeah. not to be saved, um, why not just take my life? And if I have these feelings to kill myself, God predestined me to have these feelings. Exactly. So, and obviously it's a broad stroke here with Calvinism because there's many yeah. in that genre. Some aren't determinist. Many are. But um, yeah. And, and I think it kind of goes against this whole point of what Jesus is saying. Why is he telling his believers to do these things if they are unable to do them? <laughs> exactly. It's like, well, why teach if we're pre-programmed? Exactly. So, um, yeah. So, but side note, but threw that in. Mm -hmm. For if you love those who love you, what reward would you have? Mm -hmm. Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters... What are you do doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Once again, this is not this is not supernatural love, but natural love. It's mm. I love my brother because he's kind to me. He buys me a Christmas present. I buy him a Christmas present. That's fine. Sure. But that's not out of the ordinary. Jesus is saying that those who belong to the kingdom should not just love those who love you but to love enemies. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to pray for people who slander you. It's hard to pray for people who hurt you. That's right. But you do it because Jesus, he loved us when we were in sin. Mm -hmm. 
So it's just imitating him. Jesus then makes an interesting pronouncement. I want to get your take on this. Mm -hmm. He says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Yeah. From what I can understand, um, the word perfect carries the idea of being mature, being kind of complete. Yeah. Uh, not in the sense that you're fully sanctified, but you're yeah. mature. Mm -hmm. Your Father acts in mature ways, and he applies these principles. Mm. He loves his enemies. He provided salvation for all who believe. He died even for those who would reject him, mm -hmm. Scripture says. Um, since you are his sons and daughters, you should act the same way, by showing love. Are you a mature Christian who applies these things, or are you self-centered? Mm. So I think when he's saying, be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect, he's saying, you need to be mature and do all these things. Um, well, what's your take on that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Uh, to begin in verse 48, the therefore is what we'd call an inferential conjunction. He's taking what has gone before and now giving a conclusion. Mm -hmm. That helps. So everything that had just been said comes into play. He is asking mm -hmm. uh, the saints to be mature. But then on the other hand, you know, when you look at the nature of God, he is perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> he fulfills oh, the law yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, he, he completes uh, what needs to be done in order that we can be righteous. But yeah, there's definitely this aspect of his children needing to be mature, and maturity is acting upon truth and um, doing these things that don't come natural, but supernatural. And wouldn't you say, maybe not 100%, but to a degree, maturity and uh, being perfect are kind of commingled? Yes. That when you're mature, you're doing everything you should be doing. Right. Um, once again, I'm not saying you've been to the next level in your sanctification process, right, but, exactly. but you are mature. Yeah. God, we would say, is mature. He's perfect. Yeah. And Jesus says, you need to be perfect just like he's perfect. So, um, and this brings us just, I have one simple point. Um, I, it has sub points, but let's just jump to it, our employment. Mm -hmm. Jesus revealed how a mature believer in the kingdom should behave. Mm -hmm. So, here is your identity as a mature believer in Christ uh, from today's episode, mm -hmm. because we have many others at the beginning of his sermon, you know, Beatitudes and so forth. Always tell the truth. So now, this is when I would challenge the listener to examine the, their self. Mm -hmm. Do you always tell the truth? Um, when you say you will be there, will you be there? When you say I will do this, will you do this? Um, are you a trustworthy person? Mm -hmm. because you always tell the truth. And you're the type of person, you don't even have to say, I, I swear I'll be there, anything like that, because people, when you say it, it's done. Yeah. When someone insults you, you don't seek revenge. Mm. That's a hard one. Yeah. Um, be it personal insult or even a slap across the face. Mm -hmm. um, that goes so against our culture, but you don't seek revenge. Oh, well, back when I had cable, because we cut cable due to cost and honestly wasted time. But I used to watch, you know, some sports shows. And you would have guys, you know, and they're all egomaniacs, <laughs> most of them. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, yeah, if someone says something bad to me, I'm just going to go right back. You know, that, that kind of whole attitude. Mm -hmm. Sadly, that's what I see. Uh, we're located right outside of D.C. And, you know, the culture is a very violent um, culture and mm -hmm. it's if someone hurts you, you know, you get all up in their face, and you even see like little kids at youth group five, uh, four and five, trying to square up, you know, yeah, like do their exactly. little thing. And it's like, oh, it's so awful. Yeah. But uh, when someone insults you, you take it. Um, can you do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's supernatural. You exactly. need God's help. Go above. This is three. Go above and beyond when you have uh, when someone has sinned. Let me say it again. Make it clear. Go above and beyond when you have sinned against someone in the case that they sue you or they're coming at you. In other words, you're the one who's done something wrong. Um, do you go above and beyond and say, hey, I messed this up. I want to make it up to you. We should do that. Mm -hmm. uh, go the extra mile. That's number four. Mm -hmm. Do more than what is required of you. Don't do the bare minimum and complain. Um, Without going into details, wouldn't you agree with ministry? If people would go the extra mile, it would be so much better. Absolutely. I feel like a lot of people just do the bare minimum, <laughs> where it's like if they went the extra mile, so much more would be done. In every aspect of the Christian life, that is so true. No. And we'd have so much more done uh, because we'd be running on grace and not necessarily. And Paul even says, you know, I've, I've accomplished more than the rest of the apostles. How? 
by the grace of God, he went beyond anything that anyone would have expected or imagined. And, and he said, quite honestly, that's why he disciplined his body, uh, because he was looking forward to his eternal reward. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think sometimes going the extra mile is a supernatural act, but it's just like, it's what our Lord yeah. would have done. So let's imitate him. So go the extra mile, then five, be generous and help those with genuine needs. Mm. Um, I always cautious, there's always the money grubbers, yeah. and they pop up in every church. They do. Yeah. <laughs> I need money for this. I need money. And they just mismanage everything. Exactly. So, uh, and I, th I think the best thing, you would probably agree, that you counsel those people. Mm -hmm. um, you don't just say, oh, you blew your chances in the past. We kept right. you away. It's, <laughs> don't yeah. do that. But uh, you're generous and you help those with genuine needs. You, and once again, in your local church, it should be the type of place where people are lovingly training Exactly. Training you so that you learn how to be a better parent, how to manage your money better. Um, all aspects of your life should be, be more mature. Mm. You should be growing. Mm -hmm. So that, Absolutely. that's an important point. But be generous and help those with genuine needs. Mm. Display love. And this is the last one. Display love and pray for your enemies. Mm. Um, I find when I pray for my enemies, it makes you evaluate yourself. Exactly. Because <laughs> you're like, hey, when... Jesus was on that cross. Hmm. I won't go so far to say he thought of me. Mm -hmm. um, I would more say from a biblical standpoint that he was obeying the Father. Mm -hmm. But it was the Father who had sent his son to pay for the sin of the world. Exactly. And uh, point. that love that he showed me, the Father showed me love, and Jesus in submission showed the Father love, mm -hmm. <laughs> which all worked in concert together. Yeah. Um, so how can I not pray for my enemies when he prayed for his? Mm. So qu questions I need to ask myself, and just a couple short ones. Am I a mature Christian as defined by Jesus? Am I exhibiting these characteristics Jesus spoke of in my daily life? Mm. So we can't just talk about them. We have to live them. And these are ones we need to live publicly. Exactly. There's other, I don't know, sometimes as a pastor, it feels like some people, not all obviously, but some, what they should live out quietly is what they want to broadcast out loud. Yeah. <laughs> and what they should broadcast out loud, they do quietly. Oh, you're right. Um, you know, yeah. I'm fasting. Or let me tell you about my great prayer life. Or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, they tell you about all these spiritual things, but then they're not shining their light. They won't go the extra mile. They expect mm -hmm. you to go the extra mile. They're not generous. They don't oh. pray for their enemies. They, they seek revenge. They don't mm -hmm. tell the truth. Mm -hmm. So um, thoughts. What can help me mature? What may be keeping me from maturing? How can I become the man or woman Jesus wants me to be? Mm -hmm. uh, we can find a lot of those answers in Scripture. Yeah, We can find a lot of that by our local church going, uh, investing in relationships. Um, I've always said, and uh, I'm always amazed that, you know, I am. I always try to make myself available for the youth, mm -hmm. and it's. I think it's always sad how many don't say, "Hey, can we talk? Can we have an extra Bible study?" Mm -hmm. um, because these are available, mm -hmm. and uh, I kind of wish sometimes more would say, "How can I mature?" Or come and say, "You know, I'm weak in this area." Mm -hmm. um, some of the best questions I've been asked is by people who are honest and say, "Tell me where I'm weakest," or "Tell me where I'm lacking." And to have that conversation because they want to grow. Um, any thoughts before we uh, finish up here? No, transparency is uh, such a blessing to the pastoral mm -hmm. staff because we want people to recognize their own faults as mm -hmm. we recognize our own faults and work on them. Paul expected the Corinthians to be mature after five years. You know, he was there in AD 51. He writes Corinthians in about 56, and he has to speak to them as still the carnal. So we should be maturing, and by it being attached to Christ, and walking with him, we can do the supernatural and not just the natural. Yeah, and uh, you're not a robot, right? So it takes work. It takes work yeah, <laughs> in the sense uh, that's right. You know, no book is read by itself. That's right. Unless you have a book, but you just have to play if it's an audio book. Yeah. But uh, point being is, you got to put the time in. You got to put time into the relationships, into the reading, into the praying. Exactly. So. And, I, and I'm really looking forward to our next Bible study mm -hmm. because we talked about loving uh, your enemies, and now we're going to be moving into chapter six. Yes, on, on how to give, mm. how to pray, mm -hmm. the Lord's prayer, 
and how to fast. Mm. So now we're moving away from those public displays yeah. of let my light shine in front of men to private devotion to our Lord. So, uh, that was podcast 24, the Sermon on the Mount, telling the truth, going the second mile, and loving your enemies from Matthew 5, through 48. Uh, we always love to hear from you. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you watch this, just give it a little like. Let's us know that people are engaged. It helps. Uh, I know with Pastor Ken, uh, my dad, when we go places, sometimes people say, I love it. Mm-hmm. It's like, I had no idea you were watching this. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let us know or just send us an encouraging note, just a little like, uh, whatever. And uh, if you have any questions, please, please contact us. Uh, we're, we're not, uh, not going to just ignore you. So uh, uh, keep it nice. Don't be nasty. And uh, I'm looking forward to our next podcast. So we'll see you next time.